Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to our uh, third Q webinar. The webinar series organized by uh, Q World. Today uh, we will have uh, Ronald De Wolf. We thank to him accept our uh, invitation. He will talk about the potential impact of quantum computers on society. He had this paper also published, and now uh, he will he will explain more. Uh, so. Ronald has a three affiliation at the moment, uh, QSoft, CVI, and University of Amsterdam. Uh, I think this QSoft is also quite, uh, has an important uh, role. Uh, it is a stand for Research Center for Quantum Software. It is located in Amsterdam. Uh, there was also one uh, quantum software manifesto, maybe some of you read it, it was uh, published 2017, I guess, or something. Uh, I also recommend such, I, must, I, I recommend to check it also on the, uh, yeah, you can search it and check it. Uh, it's one of the first, maybe very formal and also extensive document uh, why quantum software is important. This document is also kind of inspiring for us to start all this keyword thing. Uh, so CVI, uh, Ronald is a research, uh, senior researcher there. It's also stand for Dutch Center for Mathematics and Computer Science. And he is also full professor in University of Amsterdam. Uh, so this is our team from QWORLD uh, preparing this uh, webinar. Uh, I am, uh, I am, I am Abu Zaria Karilmas, but you can uh, call me Abu shortly. Uh, so Aga and I just uh, take care of the organizations and with Zoltan uh, we will be will moderate uh, the Q webinar. Uh, we have uh, different titles under Q World. Uh, we are kind of a network of 50 people, uh, but actively working for Q World, we are still less than 10. This is why each of us has more than one uh, title. So all of us are Q World members. Uh, also for local, Zoltan is from Hungary. I am Aga from uh, Q Latvia. Uh, I am also leading uh, overall Q World uh, initiative. Uh, I am also take care of a channel called Q Junior. We have a separate channel called Q University. Zoltan is a, a coordinator there. Aga is uh, our head of PR or public relation. Uh, she is also uh, take part in the Q Woman channel. So let me talk about the agenda for today. Uh, I will shortly introduce our code of contact and protocol for the meeting, and then there will be little further information about the keyword. Then I will give stage to Ronald, and then we will have a question answer session. Uh, if you have somewhat some question about keyword, after this uh, question and answer session, uh, we can also give some time for you. It's no problem, but it will be like uh, unofficial, not like the part of Q webinar. <coughs> So as a keyword, we are very careful about uh, code of contact and like ethic issues. Uh, so this is also activity of keyword. So we should be all nice to each other. And if you see any problem, please contact me or Zoltan. Uh, also, we are uh, recording this meeting and there will be also, uh, we will put it also in the YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, we have uh, some application form. It might seem very bureaucratical, but we also ask your permission there. And none of us ask the permission of others. So please don't record this meeting. Also don't broadcast this meeting. And for question answer, uh, you can simply write on the comment box. Uh, I will also help Zoltan. Uh, we will use a Google Doc. Immediately I will enter your question and then Zoltan will ask later uh, to run out. And if you have another comment, also please use uh, this uh, channel, I mean, uh, comment box. Uh, so this is our motto. We invite everyone to be the part of the second quantum revolution, but it's not like a sim only invitation. This is more about uh, creating opportunities for everyone to join to this uh, revolution. This is uh, maybe more concrete to say it. And uh, this is kind of, uh, everything in a single shot. Uh, there are many, uh, let's say, groups, uh, people and organization. They are all trying to build an open global quantum ecosystem and QWORLD also directly working uh, towards this uh, direction. Of course, we want to focus on uh, 
also specialized on education, software, science, technology, and documentation. So here you see our channels, uh, our networks and projects. Uh, among two cousins is the uh, main uh, network at the moment. Uh, we are eight uh, groups around the world. Uh, you can see the list. Uh, so we also have a channel of Q Woman. Uh, under this channel, we organize five workshops. Uh, this channel has recently started and we also have two groups from Turkey. Uh, they form the Q Sisters Network. Uh, we also have a special channel for high school students. At the moment, we organize just two workshops, but in the upcoming time, we will also expand it. We also have a special channel for preparing uh, material. Uh, we say it like cooking materials. This is why we call it Q Kitchen. At the moment, we have a very introductory material. We call it bronze. Uh, but it's still enough to make two or three days long workshops and indeed we did in our network 31 such workshops and by end of this uh, August uh, we are also preparing materials at the moment and we will uh, have more materials uh, for example continuation of this bronze will be ready we call it silver we will have some materials on quantum machine learning quantum key, key distribution and quantum compiling and error correction Currently, we can offer uh, up to, let's say, four days workshops, but end of the August, most probably, we will have enough material to organize a single uh, school on quantum uh, software. Uh, regarding projects, we already implement one big project. Uh, it was last summer. We call it uh, QDrive uh, because there was a small team. Uh, I was leading this team at that time, and we really on the car and we traveled more than 10,000 kilometers, especially in Eastern Europe and Balkan countries. Uh, we traveled almost 80 days and we organized 11 workshops in eight countries and we hand out more than 200 diplomas and all these Q word ideas, Q cousins ideas and some other ideas uh, somewhat uh, just developed during this Q drive also. And this summer, uh, we also make another step. Uh, it's called Q Intern uh, Internship Program. Uh, but it's internal. Uh, it will be pilot program for, and we will also, uh, until now, we just ex, uh, has uh, ex more experience on education. And now we also test ourselves for research and implementation, open source, source software development. We will still continue for educational material development. And also we will start some, uh, let's say a combination of social science and uh, quantum technologies and try to understand uh, social aspect of quantum technologies by doing certain research. And uh, in short, uh, we have more than 30 uh, workshops. Uh, we have one uh, two day long hackathon. It's organized by Q Turkey. Also recently we did uh, four days uh, long online workshop. It's also done by the uh, Q Turkey. So, uh, my presentation is finished now. If you have some questions about keyword, just uh, after finishing uh, question answer session of Ronald, you can ask us. We can stay a little more and we will not record it and we will not put it on the YouTube. So it will be kind of unofficial part. So Ronald, you can uh, take the stage now. Okay, uh, how do we do with the screen share? Maybe I can stop just in case. Should I like redo my screen share? Yes, yes. Let's yes. see if this works. Perfect. Is it okay? Yes, it's, that's the one that we chose, yes. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, thanks guys for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I've been in lockdown for almost three months now. I'm in dire need of a haircut. Um, this is going to be a fairly, uh, fairly sort of light overview-ish talk. It's not going to be a technical talk. Uh, it's going to be about the sort of the impact that quantum computers will have on society, right? So I'm not going to, to do all sorts of technical things with uh, cats and brass, but more talk about potential effects that, uh, that actual citizens will notice. Uh, and this talk is based on a, on a little paper that I wrote a few years ago, which you can find on the archive. Um, and my affiliations are uh, CWI and University of Amsterdam. These are two separate institutes. And then QSoft is sort of the name of the institute combining the quantum computing research at CWI and at the University of Amsterdam. So let's 
uh, talk a little bit about me. So I saw the previous speakers in this series also had a little bit of biographical information at the start. So I'll, I'll just do one slide that, that sort of tells you where I came from and what I've been doing. Um, so I uh, sort of, uh, as, as a student, um, I did a double major in uh, computer science and philosophy in Rotterdam, graduated a very long time ago. Uh, then I went to Amsterdam for my PhD. Um, in practice, this was at CWI. Uh, my uh, advisors were Harry Berman and Paul Vitagny, and this was uh, on quantum computing. I was actually supposed to do a PhD on machine learning, but in my first year, I kind of switched over to quantum computing. Uh, this switch was in 1997, and you, as you can imagine, this was sort of an excellent time to enter quantum computing. Uh, some of the main algorithms had just been discovered. Quantum error correction had just been discovered. This was a very exciting time to, to join the field. Uh, and I've been working in this area for the last 23 years. Uh, after my PhD, I did a postdoc in Berkeley uh, with Umesh Fazirani. And nowadays, I'm uh, like, like uh, Abu said, I'm a senior researcher at CWI and a full professor at the University of Amsterdam. And more interesting, uh, maybe, is what I'm working on. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of working on the, the theoretical computer science aspects of quantum computing broadly. Uh, and most of that is quantum algorithms and complexity theory. And some of the things I've been doing are, are proving some limitations uh, of quantum computers. Quantum computers are, of course, not sort of uh, a solution to every problem. Uh, in many cases, they're not faster than classical computers. And that's what uh, the topic of my PhD thesis was, so lower bounds on quantum algorithms. Done work on uh, quantum communication complexity, for instance, uh, the quantum fingerprinting technique. Um, one thing that I really like is um, sort of taking the tools, the mathematical tools of quantum computing and applying those to other uh, questions, let's say questions in pure math or questions in classical complexity theory, uh, because our field is generating this very rich stew of all sorts of uh, mathematical techniques that are being thrown together and then applied to quantum information problems. But those techniques can actually be applied more widely to help other subfields. And I've, there's some, some nice examples of that. Um, I've worked on, on quantum learning theory, which is kind of the theoretical end of quantum machine learning. Uh, and most recently, I've been, been working on uh, quantum algorithms, especially ones for, uh, for optimization problems. Um, and as I always tell my students and basically everybody that I meet on the street, if you want to learn more, just read my lecture notes. You can also find those on the archive. This is sort of an introduction to quantum computing from the perspective of a theoretical computer scientist, because that's my perspective. Good, so on, on to the actual content of the talk. So I want to talk about the societal impact, or maybe I should say potential societal impact of quantum computing. Um, and if you have questions during the talk, feel free to interrupt me, or you can also just type your questions into the chat and then Zoltan will relay them to me at some appropriate time. Yes. Um, so quantum computers, um, I guess most of us uh, have some at least vague notion of what they are. Uh, they combine two interesting fields, two sort of fundamental developments of 20th century science. One, of course, is quantum mechanics. And this was developed starting from the 1900s by people like, uh, like Planck and Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrödinger and various other people. Um, and it also, sort of the second strand that comes together is the computing strand. And so computer science as a scientific field was developed starting from the 1930s. Uh, you can take uh, Alan Turing's uh, 1936 paper as a starting point if you want a precise starting point. This is where he introduced the, uh, the universal Turing machine and where he showed that, that it's undecidable for any algorithm whatsoever uh, to, to determine whether a given program will ever stop or not. Um, and recently, uh, the British sort of recognized uh, Turing. They, they mistreated him in his life, but they recognized him recently. So they put his face on the on the 50 pound note, as you can see on the slide here. And that's sort of an honor, but sort of maybe also not because it's, it's, this is the highest denomination note they have in the UK, which means that this note is mostly used by drug dealers, right? So the drug dealers are all the time hanging around with the Alan Turing notes. And what is quantum computing? Well, quantum computing is of course the merger of these two strands of 20th century science into one area. And this could have started in the 1930s, but for some reason it only started in the 1980s uh, when people like Richard Feynman and David Deutsch uh, had the, the, in retrospect, obvious, but at the time totally brilliant idea to, to try to use those quantum mechanical effects, the, the weird physics that underlies uh, small particles to try to improve computers in a fundamental way. Right, so this is the, the, the field as it, as it started and it has been going for a number of decades. 
Uh, and the last few years, it has really reached sort of a hypey stage where the, the press has fallen all over this, venture capitalists have fallen all over this. Um, and, and I think the, the, the claims for quantum computing have been somewhat exaggerated. So on the web, I found this nice, this graph here made by some company called Gartner about how all sorts of technologies go through various stages. So initially they're sort of new and innovative, then they're, they're being hyped further and further. You get to the so-called peak of inflated expectations. Then people are disappointed because the technique doesn't deliver what they thought it would deliver. So you fall off this cliff of disappointment. And then the technique matures and, and, and the line goes on and it, it sort of becomes a commodity at some point. And in 2018, according to these Gartner people, quantum computing was here, right? So still climbing, but getting closer to, uh, to the peak of uh, inflated expectations. Um, for some reason, they have not included quantum computing in their most recent graph for emerging technologies, which is why I have the 2018 version here. But I would say we're probably a little bit closer to the top here, maybe still going up, but close to the, the, the peak of inflated expectations. Right, if you, you often get the impression that quantum computers are just going to solve everything very fast, uh, which of course is not the case. Um, so where do we actually stand today in terms of quantum computers? Well, uh, we, I mean, stuff is actually happening and, and there is massive progress in experimental physics uh, approaches to building a quantum computer. Um, and John Preskill, a few years ago, he coined this term, the noisy intermediate skill quantum technology which sort of means that we have small quantum computers, but they're pretty crappy. Um, so companies like Google, IBM, and Intel, unfortunately, these are all US companies, unfortunately for Europeans like me, uh, they're, they're close to having a quantum computer with between 50 to 70 reasonably good qubits, right? And that's not a lot. Um, if you look at classical computers, even a simple smartphone, it will have billions and billions of bits. Uh, and they will be much better behaved than your typical qubit. They will be much less susceptible to noise than your typical qubit as it is realized in the lab today. Um, so reasonably good qubits are not that great. Um, if you wanna make them better, you can do that by using the recipes of quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerant computing. But this involves taking a qubit and encoding it into many more qubits for protection by building in redundancy, which means that you need even more qubits. And, and this is quite far from our current sort of technological state of the art. Uh, you can do interesting things with the current quantum computers. Of course, the, the big whopper there is the, uh, the quantum supremacy uh, experiment uh, by Google last year by the Martinez group. Uh, so they showed that some quantum computation, namely the sampling from a random low depth circuit, uh, could be done efficiently on their computer. Basically, it was what their computer sort of this was the innate task that their computer was solving um, and that it cannot be solved on, on today's best supercomputers in a reasonable amount of, amount of time and there was a bit of discussion like how fast the best classical supercomputers could solve this circuit sampling but i think if, if you sort of look under the hood everybody agrees that um, that if you make the, the google experiment just a little bit bigger currently it used 53 qubits but if you were to do it with 60 qubits then the task that they're solving uh, is, is way beyond any, any reasonable classical supercomputer. Uh, but the problem they're solving is totally useless. And, and I think this is uh, kind of typical uh, for the, the current state of technology. The quantum computers that we have today are super interesting physical machines, but they're computationally still quite powerless. Um, and I think useful supremacy, by which, by which I would mean uh, solving some interesting and useful computational problem much faster than, than any classical computer could, uh, this, this I think is still years away, maybe a decade away, maybe two decades away. I, I, really, uh, I really find this hard to predict, but it's not around the corner. Um, and what is the, the goal of this talk? You can see him here, we can call him Charles. So the goal of this talk is to actually assume that the physicist will succeed, to assume that large quantum computers will be built sometime in the next decades, and then to see what impact they will have in the sense of, uh, of, of like really changing things that people will notice. And by people, I don't mean the academics uh, hold up in their ivory tower, but let's say society would notice this. Uh, and I think there's three areas that I'll talk about uh, in, for most of this talk where they will have a real impact. And those are the areas of cryptography, uh, optimization, and simulation. 
Um, there's also the area of machine learning, which is really one of the most high piece subjects within quantum computing. Um, and they might have a real impact there, but it's less clear. Um, and then there's also lots of things, like I said, a quantum computer is not a great solution for every computational problem out there. There's also lots of things where quantum computers will not help. For instance, they will probably not efficiently solve uh, NP hard computational problems like traveling salesman problem, protein folding, etc. You might get some small speed up there, but certainly not an exponential speed up. And they will also not, not end climate change and they will not end world hunger and they will not find extra, extraterrestrial life. Uh, and I'm mentioning these things here because uh, when Google just got into the act of, of, of working on quantum computing, they issued this very sort of high peak promotional video that sort of suggested that a quantum computer would, would help with all these things. It would help end climate change, world hunger, find ET, et cetera. Um, and this is, this is uh, seriously overblown. On the other hand, I can see where they're coming from. And, and during the talk, I will sort of indicate some computational problems where quantum computers would help that might just contribute a little bit to ending climate change or world hunger or finding extraterrestrial life. And so the, the main plan of this talk is to go over these three impact areas here, cryptography, optimization, and simulation. Uh, I think these are the areas where quantum computers, if indeed they are built in the next few decades, will really have an impact that's not noticeable to society. And after that, I'll talk a little bit about the um, sort of ethical dangers of the, these developments to society. Okay, let's talk about the first uh, impact area, cryptography. Uh, and this, of course, is the most obvious one. Uh, quantum computers can crack lots of cryptography. This is something that everybody knows. Um, what can they break? Specifically, they're, they're very good at breaking our current public key crypto systems. Uh, and public key cryptography is a beautiful invention. It dates from the 1970s. Uh, and the idea is the following. So suppose I want other people to be able to send me encrypted messages uh, in such a way that nobody can tap the channel, take off the encrypted message and read it. I should be the only one able to read the encrypted message. Uh, so how does public key uh, cryptography solve that problem? So you, or in this case me, you choose two keys, a private one and a public one. You keep the private one to yourself and the public one you put on your homepage or some other publicly accessible location. And then somebody else wants to send you a message and everybody who can see the public key, and that means everybody who can look at your homepage, uh, can use that public key to encrypt their messages to you. Um, so you get this little picture here as the original data that the sender wants to send to me. You use the public key for encryption. This becomes some sort of scrambled piece of data that looks like gibberish that's being sent over a channel. Everybody can tap the channel and they can't really decrypt the scrambled data without having the private key. And in principle, only the person with the private key, that would be you or whoever issued the key, uh, should be able to, to decipher this message. Um, and the little secret here is that uh, other people would also be able to decipher this if they can solve some really hard computational problems with which we believe cannot be solved efficiently. Uh, so uh, public key cryptography is always underlined by some hard computational problem that's kind of hard to, to solve uh, in one direction and easy to solve in another direction. A famous example is, is multiplication. Uh, it's easy to multiply two large numbers together. It's very hard to take the product of two large numbers and to break it up into its prime factors. So this is kind of the canonical uh, hard computational problem that so far public key cryptography has been built upon. So for instance, the famous RSA system uh, by Ravist, Shamir and Edelman is built on the assumed hardness of factoring. They assume that no classical computer can efficiently break, let's say a 2000 bit integer into its prime factors. And another famous one is, uh, is finding discrete logarithms. Uh, for instance, elliptic curve cryptography uh, is based on that. And the punchline, of course, is that uh, Shor's quantum algorithm from the 90s um, can, can solve these two computational problems very rapidly. So it can factor large integers into their prime factors very quickly. It can uh, find discrete logarithms very quickly. And that means it can break all the cryptography that's, that's based on the assumed hardness of, um, of these computational problems. Um, there's also other cryptography out there. For instance, there are so-called symmetric crypto systems like AES. This is based on, on two parties having a shared key that they use to send each other messages. 
these are much harder to break for quantum computers. You can, you can break them a little bit better than a classical computer would, but these things are much less susceptible to an attack by a quantum computer. Nevertheless, even if you would only use a quantum computer to break, uh, let's say, RSA and elliptic curve cryptography, this would still have a pretty big impact on the world. Like a lot of e-commerce would basically fall apart because you couldn't protect the security of uh, financial transactions on the internet. Uh, so that was um, um, the, the impact that uh, quantum computers, in particular Shor's algorithm, would have on, uh, on classical cryptography. Uh, and you could ask yourself whether this is something you should be worried about now. So is this an imminent threat? Well, yes and no. So on the one hand, you could say quantum computers are not going to happen anytime soon. Right? So there's this, this Google computer of 53 qubits, something like that. It's a major achievement but it's very far from the, from the millions of good qubits that you would need to run Shor's algorithm. So maybe we shouldn't worry and just relax and go to the beach. Uh, and then maybe not, you know, who knows, like, uh, like classical computing is full of all sorts of breakthroughs that, that led to faster computers. Of course, there's the invention of the transistor, uh, but many, many others, this long sequence of improvements that led to faster and faster and faster uh, classical computers. And it's not impossible that the same would happen suddenly with quantum computers and that's uh, quantum computers, large quantum computers would be built much faster than I expect. Another issue is that uh, even if there's no quantum computer built today, but only let's say 20 years from now, which is a more, I would say, realistic assumption. Um, if you send your RSA encrypted message today and somebody taps it, they would be able to decrypt it 20 years from now. Uh, and if your message really contains important secrets, even that you don't want. So for instance, uh, many countries, for instance, have laws requiring sort of the highest class of top secret documents to be protected for the next 20 to 30 years. And if you look at the horizon of the next 20 to 30 years, at that point, you really have to start worrying about large quantum computers being built on that time scale. Um, also, if you want to change this by sort of moving away from the, the crypto systems that quantum computers would threaten, like RSA and elliptic curve cryptography, it takes a long time to actually change the software in all the browsers uh, to do that. So, so even if you don't believe that a quantum computer will be built uh, in the next few years, you might still already be worried right now for these reasons about uh, the impact of quantum computers. How would you do something about this impact? So how can you save cryptography from quantum adversaries? From, let's say if the mafia or whoever builds a quantum computer, what can you do about it? How can you prevent your money from being stolen? There's basically two, two avenues that people have tried uh, and are trying to, to, to deal with this, to, to kind of rescue cryptography from quantum. Uh, one thing is to just sort of keep the public key cryptography that we know and love, keep everything classical. Uh, and just base it on a different computational problem than let's say factoring or, or discrete logarithm. And this is a pretty reasonable thing to do. So there's a lot of work nowadays on, on finding other hard computational problems that still have enough structure to use for uh, public key cryptography. For instance, problems based on lattices and codes. Um, and, and, and this is one way in which we can save uh, cryptography. Uh, the downside here is it takes time to kind of switch away from RSA and, and, and uh, elliptic curve cryptography to these other systems. And they're also not quite as efficient as things like RSA, but that's probably an acceptable price to pay to, to save cryptography. There's also the more adventurous way to save cryptography and that's from quantum and that is actually by using more quantum. So this is this area called quantum cryptography and there the idea is that you can actually make use of the, the funny effects of quantum mechanics, uh, in particular the, uh, the uncertainty principle, uh, to build new types of cryptography. For, uh, there's this famous thing called Bennett-Brassard BB84 uh, quantum key distribution. Uh, and what this does is it, it allows two distributed parties who kind of communicate over a public channel to get perfectly secret keys that only they know. And if you, if you can do that, you have an excellent basis for cryptography. That's even more secure um, than, uh, than public key cryptography would be because public key cryptography, you can typically break it if you have exponential time available. Most of us don't, but if you have exponential time available, you can always break uh, public key cryptography, even the ones based on problems like lattices and codes. Um, so this is the, the, the cryptographic part of what I wanted to talk about. Um, 
so, <clears throat> sorry, Ronald, uh, then I would just interrupt for a question. Yes, yeah, probably a good time. Question popping up. Of course, you mentioned RSA and uh, how uh, Shor's algorithm could be used to break that uh, with factoring. And uh, Imon Darcy, who is actually just applying to be a mem uh, building a Q Perth in Australia, a member of Q World team here, mm -hmm. he asked that, uh, like, uh, a uh, few years ago, the largest number quantum computer could factor with Shor's algorithm was 15. Well, Shor's mm -hmm. algorithm. Okay. What would you say, or do we know what it is now? Do you have any idea about that? Uh, it's probably a little bit bigger, but not very impressive. Uh, yeah. they, I think they, they probably factored the number 21. Uh, the outcome was not very surprising. <laughs> uh, Yes. Uh, there's also a slight issue there, like like how much of Shor's algorithm you, you implement. If you just implement sort of the core subroutine, you're slightly cheating because you're exactly. saving on qubits. Then uh, I don't think this this Google machine has been used to factor. I mean, it's it's a 53 qubit uh, universal, in principle, universal quantum machine. You should be able to run Shor's algorithm, you know, to factor a number of maybe 15 bits or so. I don't think that has been done. Um, but I think the short answer is uh, nothing very impressive has been factored so far. And, and this is also not, not the first real world application where quantum computers will be useful. I'll talk about other things later. Uh, th th thank you very much. Then suddenly two other questions popped up around this. So uh, what would you say, uh, how uh, susceptible are cryptocurrencies to that? Or, or if somebody is working with cryptocurrencies, is there a threat from quantum computers around that? Uh, there is a paper about it, I think, from some people in Singapore. Um, I think there were sort of components of, uh, of cryptocurrencies that were under threat. So one issue is that um, a lot of cryptocurrencies are, are based on uh, the hardness of inverting hash functions, that you just have to do a lot of work to invert a hash function or to find a collision in a hash function. This is something you can speed up quadratically or something like that with a quantum mm -hmm. computer. Um, that's probably not too much to worry about because yeah. the, the people who designed the cryptocurrency, um, they could just make their keys somewhat bigger and, and yes. deal with the, make the problem more than quadratically harder. And yes. I think the threats from quantum computers there is, is not so big. I think there was another sort of aspect of cryptocurrencies. Of course, there's many cryptocurrencies, but I think some of them were also vulnerable to the exponential speed up that Shor's algorithm gives. Uh, I think some parts of cryptocurrencies uh, involve public key crypto. Uh, if this public key crypto is based on factoring or discrete logarithms, uh, then this is vulnerable to quantum. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's, there's probably ways to, to design a cryptocurrency that, that uses post-quantum cryptography, you know, something based on lattices or so, and that, that makes the keys long enough so that, uh, so that quadratic speedups don't hurt you, and uh -huh. you can probably make these, uh, these cryptocurrencies fairly safe. Yes, although there are some work on doing cryptocurrencies with these uh, post-quantum cryptography algorithms yes. included. And then a final question from Adam Gloss, who is actually also a member of uh, Q World of Q Poland, which actually this was also what I wanted to almost mention, just as a moderator, I didn't want that. Actually, besides the Shor algorithm, there are new NISC algorithms for factorization, including quantum annealing. For example, there was this talk by Zapata, who, who was... Uh, doing uh, such a thing. Do you believe they may break RSA in the in new future before Shor's algorithm? I remember that Scott Aronson had a post actually about this kind of algorithms, but I... Uh, so I don't know these are dealing algorithms for factoring very well. Uh, I kind of doubt it. As far as I understand, uh, they're based on, on treating factoring as sort of like a generic NP problem and then translating exactly. it to an annealing landscape thereby losing all the structure. I would be kind of amazed if this works better than Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm is actually very efficient. So um, mm -hmm. if you want to factor a thousand bit number, the number of qubits you need for the, the, the plain version of, of Shor's algorithm is something like 2000 qubits, 2000 perfect qubits that is. But so disregarding error correction. Yes. So in terms of space, that's pretty efficient. Uh, and there's ways, there's a very nice paper by Cleveland Watrous to sort of um, make the depth of the circuit only logarithmic in the length of the, the number that you want to factor. That's also excellent because it means that the decoherence times that you need are, are, are kind of manageable. Now, actually running Shor's algorithm is way beyond our current technology, but it's still, it's, it strikes me that it's pretty efficient as it is. So I would be amazed if it were beaten by, by more generic annealing approaches. 
Uh -huh, uh -huh. Th thank you very much. That's for all. And then Bruno also said that some of these NISC algorithms are called the variational quantum factorizer. Thanks for this comment. And just continue. Thank you very much for the answer. Okay. Thanks. I'll continue. All right. So we move to uh, a potential impact area number two. The first one was cryptography. The second one is, is optimization. Uh, so optimization. Um, if, if, you, if you use computers, you know that optimization is one of the really the main applications that they use computers for in all sorts of areas, in industry, in science, uh, in all sorts of uh, hobbies also. Uh, so if you allocate resources to jobs, if, you, if you're a university and you want to have some sort of complicated way of, of scheduling classes in, in, in lecture rooms after the coronavirus issue is over, uh, if you want to optimize some, some design, if you want to... Uh, minimize the energy uses of usage of some device all these things are optimization problems um, and so the thing about uh, uh, Shor's algorithm is if it could actually be run to factor very large numbers or to solve discrete logarithms on large instances people will just shift away from factoring and discrete logs and these those problems will lose their practical meaning right cryptography will just sort of transition away from the things that Shor's algorithm can attack and at that point, Shor's algorithm is this, this towering intellectual creation with very little practical impact. You know, once, once cryptography has moved, moved to lattices or, or codes or whatever it turns out to be secure. Uh, optimization problems, on the other hand, uh, they will not become a curiosity. They, they, they are and will be one of the main application areas of computers in general. Um, and the good news is that, that quantum computers can help with some optimization problems to some extent. So the speedups here are, are generally not as impressive as they are for Shor's algorithm, uh, but the speedups are for much more useful problems. So I want to focus now for a little bit on, on optimization problems. Uh, and let me just mention a few of the quantum techniques that, that can help in optimization problems. So sort of the, the mother of these, these speedups is, is Grover's search algorithm. And basically what this says is if you have a very large search space, let's say of some number of n items, and you, you want to look through, look for a specific item, uh, a quantum computer can do this in time roughly square root of n, given the right access to the, to the search space. And that's quadratically faster than is possible classically. Um, and there's many, many sort of more uh, fancy speedups uh, that, that kind of combine Grover's algorithm with other tools. Um, so one interesting example is, um, right, if, you, if, you, if you're in a car and you use your navigation software, you want to find the shortest route, let's say, from Riga to Amsterdam, you can type that into your little uh, navigation software and it will very quickly find the shortest route or the cheapest route from Riga to Amsterdam. Um, and this is a problem, it's solved by, uh, by classically by something called Dijkstra's algorithm. It was actually invented at CWI in the 1950s. Um, and a quantum computer can do it more efficiently. So Dijkstra's algorithm takes time roughly n squared if you have a map with n cities and a quantum computer uh, can do this um, polynomially faster. Let me, let me skip the details here. Um, another example are speedups for various uh, convex optimization tasks. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the typical approach that people have for convex optimization task is um, uh, you want to, to sort of minimize a function, in this case, the blue line, uh, so you want to find this lowest point here. What do you do to do this? Well, you start at some point, say this black bubble here, and then you, you compute the gradient of your function, so the sort of the direction of change, and you move a little bit, one step in the direction of, of biggest change, because you sort of greedily want to move towards the minimum of your function, and you repeat this a bunch of times. And this is called gradient descent, and this is really the workhorse of, um, of, of lots of uh, minimization uh, approaches. And if the function you want to uh, minimize is convex, so it sort of has a nice roundish shape, you can show that uh, the point that the, the gradient descent will end up in is not just sort of a local minimum, but is actually the global minimum. Uh, and uh, one of the speed ups you can show is that quantum computers can compute the gradient of a given function more quickly than, they, than a classical computer can. So this, this gives you a, a broad class of speed ups for, for convex optimization problems. And there's also more, more fancy approaches, for instance, uh, for solving linear programs and semi-definite programs more quickly. Right, so I'm not gonna go into details. This is meant to be an overview talk. I, I basically wanna tell you that there's a whole bunch of, of, um, uh, of optimization problems where quantum computers can give you some speed up over classical computers. 
Uh, and typically, like I said, this speed up is kind of limited. It's not the exponential speed up that Shor's algorithm gives you. Uh, and whether such a, such a speed up is, is worthwhile really depends on the cost of a quantum computer, right? So you could imagine having a search space of size n. Um, a classical um, algorithm would take time roughly n to go through this search space, just look at every item once. And a quantum algorithm would take some constant c times square root of n, where the c is kind of related to how efficiently or how expensive it is to, to build your qubits and your quantum operations. Uh, and of course, c times square root of n uh, is only less than the classical cost of n when n is big enough. So whether or not these approaches will beat um, classical algorithms for practical problem instance sizes, this really depends on, on how expensive it is to, uh, to build a quantum technology. And of course, my hope is, everybody's hope is that at some point there will be something like a quantum Moore's law that says that uh, the qubits um, become better and cheaper at an exponential rate over time. If this happens, then, then these optimization things will, will definitely become relevant. Um, another technical issue here that I wanted to mention is that, um, so here you typically, you're operating on some classical input. For instance, if you want to find the shortest route from, from Riga to Amsterdam, your input would be a map, let's say a map of Europe with cities and distances between cities. This is a classical input. And your quantum algorithm would have to access these inputs, for instance, different distances between pairs of cities, it would have to be able to access that in quantum superposition. And that's, that's kind of tough. So like it, it's technologically very hard to, to store a classical piece of data, like, like the picture of a, of a map or a graph, uh, in a memory so that you can access it in superposition. And it's definitely possible in principle, but it's not easy technologically. So I just wanted to put it out there. This, this is a possible showstopper for, for the kind of algorithms I'm mentioning here. Um, so let me move on to the, one of the most famous um, instances of, of optimization, and that is machine learning. And like, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, you will have noticed that machine learning has had a massive impact on the world in the last five or six years, right? There's this famous technique called deep learning, uh, which kind of efficiently learns high depth neural networks for all sorts of classification tasks. And it has just changed a lot of things. It, it, like it's, it has really improved lots of software. Um, there's also this example of the, the poor Go player, Lee Sedol, who was beaten for the first time by a computer uh, in 2016. Uh, he lost four to one from the computer, and this was a major event at the time. But in retrospect, uh, probably the most surprising thing is that he still got one point. Uh, because by now these, these computers, these classical computers that, that play Go have gotten so much better that uh, no human will ever get a, beat, beat them in a match again, probably. Right, and, and, and what is machine learning in essence? Well, you're given a bunch of data, right? You want to learn from this. Uh, and you sort of have to tell yourself, I, I want to learn such a structure. For instance, I want to learn a, a neural network of a certain depth. And so you fix your set of possible models. Uh, you clean up your data a little bit, like you remove some noise, you kick out some outliers. And at that point, what's left is just an optimization problem. Right, so you want to maximize over the class of models that you allow yourself. Uh, you want to find a model that has the best fit with the data. Let's say the least error with respect to this data. Right, so you try to find this model uh, and then you basically hope, and in some cases you can even prove it using VC dimension theory, you hope or you prove that the, the, the model that you learned from your data will actually generalize to the rest of the world and that you can use it for all sorts of good predictions. Right, so machine learning is an optimization problem. Um, and like I said on the last slide, uh, the previous slide, quantum computers can speed up optimization problems in some cases, which means they could also be potentially helpful for machine learning tasks. Um, and this is the view of, of, of quantum machine learning as just sort of an optimization problem. There are more intimate connections between uh, quantum mechanics and machine learning. And that is that very often in these, these machine learning problems, the data that you're given consists of very large vectors. Right, so think for instance of a picture. Picture is like a 2D uh, 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 array of, of color points. Let's say 1024 by 700 something something. And this is a very long vector of numbers. Uh, every picture would be a very long vector of numbers. Similarly, if you're processing text, a sentence is a very long sequence of numbers. A book is an even longer vector of numbers. Um, and machine learning, uh, 
software typically operates on such data. And if you have a very long, large dimensional vector of, of data, one, one reflex that you get when you work on quantum computing is that, okay, I have a D-dimensional vector, D is big, but I could represent these D numbers as the amplitudes of a quantum state with only log D qubits, because a state with log D qubits has D amplitudes. So in principle, you could take these long vectors that are your classical input data, and you could kind of compress them into very small quantum states and then learn by manipulating those quantum states. And, and this is a wonderful idea, which I, I think still hasn't kind of come to fruition. Um, so this is much easier said than done to implement this idea. But if, if there will ever be an excellent quantum uh, machine learning system, like something that, that really uh, uh, blows classical machine learning out of the water, it will be something probably that makes use of this fact, the fact that large dimensional vectors somehow can be represented as very small quantum states. Um, so this is, I think, what I wanted to say about optimization. Uh, Zoltan, this might be a good time to for another round of questions, if there are. Yes, so there is one question only. So <clears throat> actually now two questions. Mm -hmm. One was more about the QRAM. So is there any algorithm that can find a particular item from QRAM like Grover did? So it's not exactly connected to machine learning, but we got it just a few minutes ago. So. What does that mean to find an item from QRAM? I don't understand the question. Yes, uh, maybe Emmanuel, uh, if you could uh, explain the question and then we can uh, ask this more part, uh, in a more detailed way during the question and answer session. And then <clears throat> there was um, another question from Bruno Federici, uh, who asked, what about encoding classical data set onto quantum operators rather than amplitudes? You could do that too. So if, for instance, a, a d-dimensional unitary sort of corresponds to d squared numbers mm -hmm. because it's a d by d matrix. Uh, you could implement um, you could implement your your data as operators as well. Somehow it feels to me more natural to kind of have sort of your classical data items converting into quantum data items. And to me, a quantum data item is sort of is more like a passive thing, like a uh -huh. state that you can operate on rather than an action such as a unitary or a super operator. Uh -huh. So it's certainly possible, but it feels less natural to me. Thanks a lot. I think that was a perfect answer. That was all the questions for this part. Okay, good. So then I'm gonna move on to potential application area number three, which is simulation. And this is quite possibly the most interesting of the three. Um, so if you look at, uh, let's say, uh, things like applied physics and chemistry over the last century, an enormous amount of effort has gone into understanding uh, the behavior of quantum systems uh, like, uh, to design better materials, uh, better batteries, better drugs, uh, high temperature superconductivity. This is actually one of these points where, where, um, where you were talking about problems that are sort of relevant for you know, uh, climate change. If you can design much better uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, you could really help, uh, help save the world from climate change. Right? I mentioned at some point that there were these, these issues that, uh, that Google hyped uh, some time ago, like saving the world from hunger, saving the world from climate change, finding extraterrestrial life. Here we see the connection, uh, slight connection with um, saving the world from climate change. Uh, so, so even in, in, in uh, pre-quantum computing days, many people worked on this. Uh, slightly surprising person who worked on this is Angela Merkel. You can see her here. Uh, she used to be a, a quantum chemist uh, in the, the East, in Eastern Germany uh, before uh, before the unification of Germany when she found something else to do. Um, and if you try to study a quantum material, uh, let's say it consists of something like like n particles, then uh, the number of amplitudes you need to describe this system in general will be exponential in n, right? And as soon as n gets moderately big, exponential in n gets ridiculously big. Uh, and that's the basic reason that, that classical methods for analyzing quantum systems and quantum materials so kind of hit a wall when the system gets bigger, unless there's really nice symmetries and structure that you can make use for. Uh, and, and this is actually the reason why Richard Feynman invented the idea of a quantum computer. He didn't care about factoring. He didn't care about NPR problems. He, he wanted a quantum computer which could sort of simulate the evolution of a quantum system. 
right? Just like a, a classical universal Turing machine can simulate any other classical system, a universal quantum machine can simulate any other quantum machine. So for instance, uh, you could build a quantum computer out of electrons and you could use it to simulate the behavior of photons or vice versa. So if you could build a universal quantum computer, it would be one particular quantum system that would be extremely versatile and able to simulate any other quantum system efficiently. Um, so this was the sort of the idea that Feynman had or the motivation for coming up with quantum computers because he, he observed that classical computers were not good at this, so he needed something else, right? And why not make your computer quantum if it wants to simulate other quantum systems? Um, and in the 1990s, uh, Seth Lloyd showed that uh, you could sort of simulate the evolution of a quantum system in polynomial time, and it was left there for a while. Now, if you're a theorist, polynomial time is fine. If you're a practitioner, the difference between uh, time n squared and n to the power of 100, both of which are polynomial, is just tremendously important. Uh, so in the last five years, people have really been um, looking more precisely at, at how efficiently you can simulate uh, the behavior of other quantum systems, like how many elementary quantum operations would you need to simulate the behavior of a quantum system that's given in the form of some Hamiltonian, for instance, a local Hamiltonian. If you don't know what a Hamiltonian is, it doesn't really matter. It's just one way to describe the, uh, the laws that act on a quantum system. Um, and the idea is that uh, I can give you a Hamiltonian, classical description of the Hamiltonian, and, and I can find for you um, an efficient quantum program or an efficient quantum circuit that sort of simulates the evolution of the system according to that Hamiltonian. So if you give me a state at time zero, quantum state, I can give you an efficient quantum circuit that will sort of convert this into the state that you would have at time t. So you can simulate the time evolution of quantum states and this is, this is potentially very useful. Right, and here we see another one of these um, sort of um, uh, super important things, world hunger. So one nice example uh, where you could use uh, quantum simulation uh, to really uh, help with a practical problem is, is to improve the, uh, the, the efficiency of nitrogen fixation. Um, and this is some sort of poorly understood uh, chemistry problem, uh, which if you could make it a bit more efficient would really improve the production of fertilizer in the world. And this is hugely important for food production. Quantum computer is not going to, uh, to, to make bread for you but it might help you a little bit making better fertilizer and therefore contribute a little bit to solving world hunger. Um, so this is, um, I think all I wanted to say about simulation, it's, it's really a big area. It's probably the area that has gotten most attention um, uh, in, in the last few years or so. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is quite well justified because it could have a huge impact and it could have a huge impact much faster than for instance, running Shor's algorithm. Uh, because it turns out that, that even moderately big numbers of qubits, let's say a few hundred, um, if they're really, really, really good qubits, already suffice to start to do interesting things in quantum chemistry. And so this is kind of likely to be uh, among the first real applications of quantum computers. Uh, and in fact, the people of, of Google, uh, I don't think they've used their 53 qubit machine to factor numbers, but they have used it to, to attack small quantum chemistry problems. Uh, and, and this is something you can expect to, to see grow and get more and more attention in the next few years. Um, you could even, you know, if at some point, if we really start to dream and we, we, we hope that uh, large quantum computers will be built and that many people will have access to these things, you could kind of see the analog of what you now see happening with 3D printers, right? So 3D printers are this, this very versatile technology that just allows lots of amateurs to play around and to make all sorts of little things and to experiment with this and to make things, right? This is called the maker movement. And you could hope that something similar would happen for chemistry if lots of amateurs had access to a quantum computer. Uh, another area that might benefit from this is uh, the area of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is currently kind of distributed also over lots of amateurs who each use their computers to search over images uh, that are taken from the night sky. Um, and in, in, these case, in these things, um, so you would have this, this, this idea that lots of different amateurs would, would start to tinker with molecules, would start to tinker with lots of things, um, and, and, and who knows what they might find. It's like if you, if you really allow thousands of enthusiastic amateurs to play around with this, who knows what they might find. Of course, there's also uh, horror stories, right? They could also 
find something terrible. Uh, but this is true for every technology. It could be used for good and it could be used for evil. Um, so this is what I wanted to say about quantum simulation. Let me give a summary so far, and then I think this would be another good point to, to briefly pause for questions. So what's the summary so far? Uh, I would say quantum computers are pretty great. Uh, they're not as great as some journalists make you think. Like, as I said, like the, the power of quantum computer is often overhyped. But they're much stronger than our current computers in some areas. And I, I covered three examples of this. So should society now be happy, right? Should we just be happy that there is this, that the quantum computer is coming and it's going to speed up lots of stuff? Or should, should society be afraid? Um, because all this speed up, uh, this could also have some negative effects. So for the remainder of this talk, um, I would like to talk about sort of the risks that the advent of a quantum computer could have for society, because I'm really trying to talk here about impacts that are relevant beyond academia that society would actually notice. I think it would be just good if you continue. There were two questions, but I copied them because it was general to the questions at the end. Okay, good. So then I'll go to the risky part of the talk. Right, so what are the risks to society? And there's a number of them. I want to focus on two uh, risks to society. The first one is kind of obvious. It's the breakdown of cryptography. Right, so as I mentioned, uh, large quantum computers can break all cryptography that's based on the assumed hardness of the, the computational problems of factoring and finding discrete logarithms. And that's a lot of cryptography that's out there today. Uh, so there's a bunch, bunch of different scenarios that could play out here. It could be that somebody builds a quantum computer, doesn't tell anybody, but uses it to, to read your email and steal your money, or maybe read Donald Trump's email and steal uh, Warren Buffett's money. Scenario number two is somebody builds a quantum computer, they're extremely proud of it, they announce it, um, they put it on archive, uh, and then they use it to read your email and steal your money. Right? And it doesn't really matter in which way this will play out. The point is that, that after a while, the world has kind of noticed that, that's, uh, that, that cryptography is no longer secure and that, that important messages leak and that money is being stolen. Right? And at that point, and this will probably happen quite suddenly when the world realizes that this is the case, all confidence in our current crypto schemes will disappear. People won't trust anything anymore. Right? Even if you're not a target of, of the mafia's quantum computer, just the mere fact that you know that the mafia could, could kind of steal your, your, your credit card number is, is very worrying. Right? At that point, e-commerce might start to collapse because you can't really do online payments anymore. Uh, and this would be a big risk to society. Fortunately, uh, by that time, and I think this is still one or two decades away, uh, I'm really sort of speculating here, but let's say one or two decades away, by that time, uh, these two tools that I mentioned to fix the problem should have uh, progressed to, to a good stage, right? So on the one hand, there's this post-quantum cryptography, which is classical cryptography, but based on other problems than factoring and, um, and discrete log. Currently, this is still kind of shaky, but I'm hoping that in a few years, uh, this could, in principle, replace everything that's based on factoring and discrete law. The real issue there is we don't really know how secure these, these lattice problems are against quantum computers. We don't know how to break them with a quantum computer, but we also don't have too much evidence. But this is something that will become clearer over the next, uh, next years. And the other avenue, of course, is, is quantum cryptography, where you use quantum communication over channels to do perfectly secure communication. Um, this this uh, is kind of harder to realize because it really needs new infrastructure. We need something called a quantum internet, or at least we need sort of point-to-point -point quantum channels to implement this. Uh, and I personally, I don't have any quantum, quantum channels uh, with the rest of the world. So this would really require new infrastructure in contrast to post-quantum crypto, which can just run on classic computers and classical networks. Right, so that's uh, risk number one. Risk number two is, is more, let's say, economical or maybe even ethical, and it's about inequality. Right, so quantum computers are extremely expensive to build, um, billions probably, at least initially, and, and they will remain quite expensive for a long time. Uh, and you could see the, the scenario, certainly initially, where, where one party or maybe only a few parties can afford to build a quantum computer. Right. In principle, the knowledge of how to build a quantum computer is kind of largely out there in theory, but actually implementing this with all the, the, the equipment around it, all the, the heavy fridges, this is just very expensive. It's going to require huge teams of experimentalists uh, working together. So what happens if only one or a few parties can afford to build one? 
well, you get inequality between countries, right? So it's, so it's possible that, for instance, only the U.S. government will be the one having a quantum computer. So maybe only the Chinese government, or maybe only the U.S. and the Chinese government. Uh, let, let's say it's only the U.S. government that, that has a quantum computer, at least for some time. This creates a massive asymmetry in, in world politics, because the U.S. will be able to read other people's email. Other people will not be able to read Trump's email. I guess even... Uh, in unencrypted form, uh, it's sometimes hard to read Trump's email, but uh, let's not worry about that. And the situation is kind of analogous to what happened with the atomic bomb at the, in the late 40s, right? So in 1945, the US had built two different types of atomic bombs, uh, detonated them over Japan. It was a massive shock to the world. And at that point, they were the only ones having this massive new weapon, right? And they could threaten other countries around. Uh, and there were some generals in the U.S. Army who wanted to use nuclear weapons against the enemy, let's say Soviet Union or China. Uh, and fortunately, the U.S. was under prudent management at the time in the form of uh, Harry Truman, who, who basically slapped down his generals and said, we're not going to do that. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. is under less prudent uh, uh, management today, and God knows what Trump would do, you know, if he, if he were, was the only one who had access to a quantum computer. Um, in the case of the atomic bomb, this sort of rectified itself or, or rebalanced itself when the Soviet Union also turned out to be able to build a bomb, uh, I think in 1949. Uh, something similar might happen with the quantum computer that, you know, after a few years of the US being the only country with a quantum computer, maybe a few years later, China builds one as well, kind of rebalancing things. Nevertheless, this creates kind of a risky uh, period of imbalance in, in world politics. And another kind of inequality is, is not between countries, but let's say more commercially between companies. Right? So suppose that a quantum computer um, indeed turns out to be a great tool for, for analyzing quantum, quantum systems, such as the large molecules that make up medicine. And let's say that there's, there's one pharmaceutical company that, that manages to build a quantum computer and its competition does not. So if a quantum computer is really excellent for designing new pharmaceuticals, then this one company with a quantum computer will have this massive competitive advantage. Uh, it, it will sort of blow everybody else out of the water. It's going to outcompete the competition. The competition will go bankrupt. And at that point, there's only one big pharmaceutical company left in the world. And what will happen in that case, they will probably raise their prices uh, uh, tremendously, right? So you, you sort of, Inequality between companies tends to create uh, monopolies or oligopolies, uh, and this is very bad for, uh, for the functioning of society. Um, so, so inequality between countries, inequality between companies, the, these are uh, great risks uh, in the initial phase where one or only a few parties have access to a quantum computer. Uh, and, and how could we deal with this? Well, there's several scenarios. Uh, the most hopeful scenario is that uh, the companies who build a quantum computer actually rent it out to everybody else, assuming those other people are willing to pay. Right? So it's possible, for instance, that, that IBM is the first one to build a large quantum computer and that they would just sort of uh, auction off uh, the time on this quantum computer so other people can use it as well for their own uh, optimization or simulation tasks, assuming those other people are, are willing to pay. Right, and a toy version of this is already happening online with the IBM quantum experience. Um, but of course, uh, this need not happen, right? So it's possible that the market doesn't provide it, that uh, IBM just keeps the quantum computer for its own tasks, doesn't rent out space on the quantum computer, or maybe the US government uh, prevents everybody else from using the quantum computer, like, like they tried to do with cryptographic software. So it was, for instance, illegal to export RSA for a while out of the US. Um, and in that case, my solution comes from a surprising corner, uh, it, namely that um, this, this could be solved by Santa Claus giving the world a quantum computer. Um, and this is, of course, a joke. Uh, uh, but of course, if you think where, where Santa Claus is, is located, he's actually located on the North Pole in, in Norway. Um, and Norway is a, is, is a very rich country, lots of oil, and they are in the wonderful habit of once in a while giving away one or a few billion for good causes, you know, to preserve parts of the rainforest, for instance. And Norway is a country that could just afford to build a large quantum computer and make it accessible to the world. And it's not the only rich benevolent source in the world. There's also, for instance, the Gates Foundation who could do this. 
So my hope is that if, the, if, if some people try to monopolize uh, quantum computing power once it's built, uh, that some other party just invests enough money for, uh, not to build another quantum computer and makes it available. And that's good enough to break the monopoly. If there's just one other quantum computer out there that everybody can run their stuff on, this breaks the monopoly. Um, so this brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, this is my summary slide, and afterwards you can pepper me with questions. So quantum computing and quantum information is wonderful science, right? This, this is my perspective. I'm a scientist. Um, I don't build these things. I, I just do this as a theoretical science, and it's a wonderful science. Um, the actual quantum computers, they may become powerful practical machines, but I think this is still years and possibly decades away. It, it's not around the corner. And I'm always surprised when I see how many startups there are now. Uh, I doubt that these things, that these startups uh, have a sufficiently long horizon um, to, to, to make their, uh, to make their, 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 their startup uh, commercially successful. Scientifically, at the very least, we can start to experiment now with these machines. It's no longer pure stuff uh, on, on paper. Uh, and I, I went over the, the main areas where I think quantum computers will have an effect that's really noticeable for society. One is cryptography, either by the breakdown or by the rescue of cryptography. Second is optimization. So you can do a lot of things much more efficiently if you could use a quantum computer's power. And the third is a simulation of quantum systems, which hopefully could lead to, you know, better batteries, better uh, solar cells, etc. I also mentioned two risks. One is the breakdown of current cryptography, which would be uh, mitigated either by post-quantum classical crypto or by quantum cryptography. And the other one is uh, increased inequality between countries and or companies. Uh, and here, hopefully the cloud will save us or Santa Claus, right? I hope that there will be at least one party in the world who will be uh, benevolent enough to, to actually build a quantum computer and make it available to many others. Um, so that's all I had. I guess I talked for about an hour. Uh, good, I have time for questions. Sultan, over to you. Thank you very much for this excellent and very <coughs> interesting and intriguing talk. And um, there are plenty of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, like everybody is saying, excellent talk, great pedagogy. I, I completely agree. So let me just share my uh, screen with the questions that were asked before your talk and also during the talk. Good. Okay. Um, Should I stop my share? Or can you override yes. it? Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop my share. Thank you. Yes, here. I hope you can see this. It says Zoltan has started screen here. Oh, there it is. Yep. Yes, see it. there it is. And and the first question is by Yasemin from Imperial College, and it's about like that I mean, you have uh, mentioned that quantum computers could have a huge impact on quantum simulation, simulation of quantum physics and quantum chemistry. What about uh, simulation of classical physics, for example, computational fluid dynamics or turbulence modeling? Yeah, it's a good question. So of course, classical physics is also very uh, full of very hard simulation problems, including uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, I guess we still don't know how to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, so I think quantum computers can be helpful here. Um, it, it will not be this part about Hamiltonian simulation, I think, because there is no quantum system to, to, to simulate here. It's rather the second application area that I mentioned, this optimization area that might help here. So uh, I can refer you to a very nice paper by Ashley Montanero and Sam Pallister about um, quantum speedups for finite element methods. Right, so I think finite element methods are one of the main ways in which it, which you attack these, these computational fluid dynamics problems. You have this continuous, continuous area, but you break it up into small pieces, so you get a discrete problem. And now you try to solve some, some uh, optimization problem uh, over these discrete elements, these finite elements, subject to a bunch of constraints. Uh, and you can get some speed ups. I think only polynomial speed ups, kind of depends on the dimension in which your problem lives. Um, um, 
So, so I think it will have an impact also on computational fluid dynamics or turbulence modeling, but it won't be as impressive as the exponential speed ups that you get from, let's say, Hamiltonian simulation, if you really want to simulate a quantum system. Thank you very much mm -hmm. uh, for this question. And then there are two very interesting questions from uh, Zeki, who is actually uh, one of the coordinators of QTurkey, one of the uh -huh. companies of, of the Q world. And actually, the first question is uh, really interesting. I really liked it that, uh, although it's a very refined question, like, can you elaborate on the relation between potential societal impact and the type of hardware we use to build mm -hmm. qubits? How would the future with superconducting qubits differ from photonics or ion trap based qubits? And should this be considered while allocating public funds to the field? Actually, I would say that there are two, it could be even split into two questions. One is the type of uh, well, I would say not qubits, but architectures like the, whether it's Q mode or qubit like photonic, or whether it's, I don't know, annealing or whether mm -hmm. it would be really um, to topological error protection or something, uh, some other type of error correction term. So what would you say about this? Would that be fair? Uh, let's say I would say that from a high level, there's basically two kinds of qubits. There's the photons and there's everything yes. else. Right, and the photons are extremely useful for communication. This is what you want to use, for instance, for quantum cryptography or uh, quantum communication complexity. And the other types of qubits, they're all sort of stationary. They're in one location. And those are more the ones you want to use for quantum computer to run an algorithm on. Uh, so uh, if you really care about communication impacts, of course, you should throw all your, all your effort into improving photons, like in improving the, let's say, the, the, prepare, the efficient preparation and measuring of photons. If you care more about quantum computation, you should probably focus more on ion trap qubits or, or solid state qubits. Uh -huh. uh, so for me, like I said, I'm a theoretical computer scientist. And if I were to study classical algorithms, I really couldn't care less how bits are implemented, right? A bit is sure. just an ab abstract variable that's zero or one, and I can do yeah. certain operations on it. Uh, I'd like to take the same haughty attitude towards quantum computing when I'm designing a quantum algorithm. I just assume that somebody builds qubits. And I really don't care whether this is an ion trap or, uh, or, or solid state or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, like on a high level, algorithms are designed in, in a way that's agnostic about the details of the actual hardware. Um, of course, there's a whole layer in between, between the people building the, the actual qubits and the people designing the abstract algorithms of people who bridge those two areas. For those people, it matters whether they're, they're operating on solid state qubits uh, or on ion trap qubits. For instance, the ion trap qubits are much more stable. They need to be recalibrated far less. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure I answered the question directly. I sort of said a few things that are related to it. Um, um, yeah, the question about the uh, al allocation of public funds, yeah, like I said, uh, kind of if you care about com communication, you should allocate money to photons. If you care about other stuff, you should allocate money probably to ion traps or solid state qubits. I agree. Actually, just <clears throat> if you are a theoretical uh, computer scientist, maybe one intriguing uh, thing with photonics could be also about uh, distributed quantum computing, probably it's also easier with the uh, photons than... Yeah, so there are these examples of distributed computational tasks where they, let's say there's Alice and Bob and they each have a part of the input and now they, they try to communicate uh, as efficiently as possible to compute some function that depends on both of their inputs. Uh, and there are examples where you can solve this with exponentially less communication if you have a quantum channel available. Uh -huh. so a, this is a general area of quantum communication complexity. And there's other applications of distributed computing where, where you really need to sort of send qubits back and forth. And, and you would probably do this by means of sending photons. Of course, just photons are probably not enough because you can prepare and measure a photon. But if you really want to operate on it, you sort of, Bob who receives the photon has to catch it, put it in a quantum memory, and then act, act with unitaries uh, on this quantum memory. So it's, So for the more fancy applications involving quantum communication, you probably need more than, uh, than photons. You probably also need some, let's say, I don't know what, ion traps, qubits or whatever, something that's able to kind of catch a photon and store it for a while. Yes, absolutely, I, I, I fully agree. Okay, thank you for this very nice answer. And actually, Zeki had another question that you mentioned Moore's law. And now there has been a similar suggestion called the Dowling-Nevin law, which actually I copied out while you were talking. It's that 
quantum computers are gaining computational power relative to classical ones at a doubly exponential rate. That's the Dowling Niven law. How realistic do you think it is? Well, in, in some some way, I mean, you can see where this where this is coming from, right? So, so suppose that there is a Morse law for the number of qubits, mm -hmm. that the number of qubits goes up exponentially in time, or the cost per qubit goes down exponentially in time. Um, then, with a system of n qubits, you can represent uh, two to the n amplitudes. You can also simulate uh, quantum systems with two to the n degrees of freedom. So if the number of qubits goes up exponentially, in a way, the number of amplitudes goes up double exponentially. Um, exactly. Yeah, so and, and this, uh, this, I would say, is a trivial observation. Uh, I think Nevin uh, recently coined this Nevin's law, and then Dowling sort of complained that he had proposed exactly. the same thing several years ago. But it's a totally obvious and trivial observation. Um, uh -huh. Um, and I think it's sort of on the hype side. It's not wrong what it says, but it kind of, it sort of suggests that, uh, that quantum computation power is going up much faster than it actually is. Uh -huh. yes. for, for two reasons. One, one reason is we don't actually have a Morse law for the number of qubits, right? So, so one of the two exponentials in the, in the dowling nevin law comes from the supposed exponential uh, increase in the number of qubits. Uh, I don't think we have that. It's also kind of hard to extrapolate from just a few years of data. We haven't been building qubits for that long. Uh, the other exponential comes from the fact that, that you can manipulate uh, two to the n amplitudes using n qubits, but uh, we, we very well know that you can't store, for instance, two to the n bits into two to the n amplitudes. There's this thing called Hollevo's theorem. So in, in many cases, the second exponential doesn't even apply. Uh -huh. in, in many cases, the fact that there's exponentially many amplitudes in, in n qubits is not, not that helpful. Um, yeah, so, so I would say my, my opinion about this law sort of, uh, sort of uh, sits between that this is a triviality versus this is a, a irresponsible hype. <laughs> Thanks. Good comments. Uh <laughs> I'm not going to comment on your comment. I, I hope neither Dowling nor Nevin is in the, in the audience. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> so, Guardan uh, from India has the following thing. Uh, what is the current status of uh, QKD and uh, is it saturated? I mean, we can do it and it's done or which direction will it go? What? Uh, we, can, we can do it. It's certainly not done. So the implementations, uh, they have been commercially available for more than 10 years. It's kind of amazing because the technology that's needed in principle is not that hard. You, for, for BB84, what do you need to do? One person needs to prepare photons quite precisely in either the uh, computational or the Hadamard basis, and the other person has to receive those photons and measure them in either the computational or the Hadamard basis. So uh, technologically, in principle, this is much, much easier than, than a universal quantum computer. And that's why people have been, in fact, selling quantum cryptography devices, quantum key distribution devices. Uh, and these things are far from perfect because we cannot perfectly prepare photons. We cannot perfectly uh, sort of catch and, and measure photons. Uh, and and uh, the, the actual implementations of QKD are, are quite prone to all sorts of malicious hacking. So there have been these attacks where you kind of throw some extra light on the receiving ends to confuse them. Um, exactly. I think this is an example that's, uh, that's quite beautiful <laughs> in theory. In the 19, late 1990s and early 2000s, there was a, were a number of different security proofs that's, that said that under reasonable assumptions, QKD is actually information theoretically secure. Um, so in theory, this is all nice. In practice, it's not nice uh, because the implementations always fall short of the, of the assumptions of the security proofs. There's also the other practical issue that you need a quantum channel to run QKD, right? And you, yes. you could put a quantum channel between Alice and Bob. You could even use kind of uh, a telephone quality fiber. It's not perfect, but it can actually yes. can transmit photons to some extent. Um, but if you actually want to do quantum key distribution, you, you want more connections. You want a network of quantum, uh, either quantum channels or, or different parties sharing entanglement pairwise. Sometimes people yeah. call this a quantum internet. Uh, we are definitely not there yet technologically. Uh, so yeah. is it saturated? Depending on what you mean by saturated, I would say theoretically, yes. Uh, practically, definitely not. Thanks a lot. For the quantum internet, there will be another question later. Okay. But for now, from Kevin Coleman, 
We have the following question. I mean, it's an obvious question, of course. When do you believe quantum computing will be commonly used by businesses? Well, some businesses are using it today in the sense that they're playing around with it. But I guess the actual question is like, when will quantum computing be used to solve sort of commercially important problems by these, by these businesses? Um, yeah, uh, this will be at least a few years. And I think a more realistic guess will be 10 years, maybe 20 years, kind of depends on what they want to solve. Uh, this, this of course is very speculative, right? Um, 10, 10 to 20 years, I would say. Uh, this, is, this is not unreasonable. I think either it will happen in 10 to 20 years or people will be so disappointed or they realize that there's so much funding needed that, that uh, much of the enterprise will be abandoned to build a quantum computer. Because yes. the time, time horizons of funding agencies and big businesses is also limited. Thank you for this. It's not, it's not going to be next year. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And then Juan Gonzalez from Mexico asks, I mean, a question that you actually already touched upon. How far are we from, uh, from the practical breaking of, um, of cryptography schemes and algorithms like LSA? Yeah, sort of the same answer as to the previous question, I think. You need thousands of, of perfect qubits, which need, means you need millions of good qubits. And this will take, I don't know what, one or two decades. It's my very rough guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I think that. Uh, of course, let me just add here. I'm not an experimental physicist, so what I'm telling you here is basically sort of what I absorbed from people who know more around me. Yes. So then there is a funny question from Marcos Karasamanis from Cyprus, and actually, I because uh, we got this question before, I even checked out this video. I mean, and. I, I opened it, but I didn't have time to watch it. Maybe you can see Yes, I mean, it's a video. I tell you what it is about. And actually, people uh, doing businesses have also approached me about such questions. So let's mm -hmm. try to answer them. This mm -hmm. is about, it's a video about how to build a quantum computer by yourself. Yeah. Um, and he asked whether, uh, whether, uh, whether, there is, um, whether this is a solution and uh, whether such open project, uh, uh, open source project could dominate. I don't know whether you have any opinion on that about question one. I mean, well, they certainly won't dominate for a long time. I mean, if you, if you look at the development of classical computers until the, let's say, early 1980s, there were, there were these massive objects, right? For, like exactly. For IBM. Uh, and then the personal computer came along uh, and, and people started to tinker with these things at home. And nowadays, several decades further, uh, you can buy these nice Raspberry Pi processors and you can really start to build your own computer from, from basic hardware components. Something like this might happen for quantum computers, but uh, it's going to be a really long time. It's, right? I, I agree. I mean, those people who are saying that they can build now and showing it, that everybody can build, I think it's maybe yeah. not the most trustable sources. And of course, I've written a question about the importance of, of open source projects. And, and if you read my little paper on the archive, I also end with a paragraph sort of advocating openness. I was not thinking about open source software, but just, you know, put your paper on the archive. Like, don't patent stuff and hide, hide your work. Um, so uh -huh. that, that's the kind of openness that I think is really important uh, for this field. And, and so far, this has been happening. But that's also because until maybe five years ago, all this research was academic. And nowadays, of course, companies like Google and IBM put in a lot of money. I'm a little bit worried, you know, that stuff will go behind a patent wall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So his second question is also combining many things. I mean, one is about, well, post-quantum crypto is not exactly, uh, so it's about the effectiveness of post-quantum crypto and, and the uncertainty around that. And, and maybe he says that the, um, I mean, he asked whether you agree, whether a, a good approach would be, would be a combination of various schemes, like doing quantum cryptography, for example, you, you know, like with QKD and also uh, put in uh, classical crypto systems. I'm not sure whether... Oh. Yeah, I can sort of see where this is coming from. I think the... Um, so... so uh, Classical post-quantum crypto requires a different, very different infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, than uh, QKD, right? So uh, classical crypto, uh, public key crypto is sort of, it has a direction. Like there's one person issuing the private and the public key or rather keeping the private key to, to themselves, issuing the public key, and then someone, everybody else can send them messages. So there's a direction there. 
QKD, on the other hand, is symmetric. The whole point there is to, for Alice and Bob, to, to get the same copy of a shared secret key. Um, so com combining QKD with, with public key cryptography, I, I don't really see that. But, but I think what would make sense is to, let's say, if there's a few proposals out there for post-quantum crypto, you know, one based on lattice problems, one based on coding problems, one based on something else, um, and you don't care too much about the efficiency of your encoding and decoding, and you're very worried that some of those problems are breakable by quantum computer, you could actually layer three different um, uh -huh. public key encryptions, one based on lattices. On top of, let's say, this creates a cipher text, an encrypted text. This you could encode further uh, with another uh, public key crypto system uh, based on codes and encode it further, maybe even with RSA, you know, why not just throw in another layer? So uh, let's say there's always a trade-off here between the efficiency of the encoding and the decoding and the security of the encoding. If, if you have time on your hands, uh, it, it would make sense to kind of stack different types of public key cryptography onto each other. I don't think it really makes sense to combine public key cryptography with QKD, uh -huh. They're really two different beasts. It's kind of a category mistake to combine those. Thanks, that was a really clear answer. And really, uh, because you don't need shared randomness for public key cryptography. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of public key cryptography. So the next question by Eda Yield is from Yildiz Technical University, Turkey. Could you mention some of those error correcting codes that are used now or could be used in, in uh, near-term devices? Could I mention them? I guess I could mention them. Yes, yeah, of course. I could not well, explain them. What, what uh, she meant means, what do you think will be the f first ones? Like what type of error correction? Well, um, so I think that a lot of, um, let's say a lot of hardware designers are, are aiming to build a relatively small surface code, which is, which encodes one qubit into something like, I think, 17 physical qubits or so. I think there's a lot of um, experimental groups aiming towards that. They want to build on the order of 20 qubits. And, and one of the things they want to do with it is to implement one logical qubit protected by a surface code. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that, uh, that will happen, but this is just sort of uh, one stepping stone along the experimental way towards a real quantum computer. The actual, the, the best quantum error correcting codes that you want to use in a big quantum computer, I have no idea what they are. People are still developing better and better codes. The better your code is, the more noise it can tolerate, and I think this development is not finished yet. I think experimentally, so the, the smallest quantum error correcting code that can protect against any type of error is the five qubit code. Yes. It takes one logical qubit and codes it into five uh, physical qubits. And then you probably need two more qubits for ancillary measurements, uh, for syndrome measurements. I think that's something that, that should be doable. Maybe it has already even been implemented in a lab. I don't know about that. I think, um, I think yeah, that... So yeah, there's not much more I can say about it. I'm also not really an expert on quantum error correction. Yes, and we had those questions by Imon and Adam about, mm -hmm. uh, yes, about those uh, <clears throat> factoring. And then uh, Emmanuel uh, extended his question. You uh -huh. remember, we were a little bit puzzled. So he, uh, he asked, is there an, an, uh, any algorithm that can find a particular item from QRAM, like the Grover algorithm? And QRAM stores vectors if we want to look a vector inside the QRAM, we need a technique that will tell us whether a vector we are looking for exists or not. Uh, I don't know if that made it more clear or mm. you can just... Yeah, I don't know what it means to look a vector. I guess it means yeah. it must be to look for a vector inside the QRAM. I, yeah, I, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Uh, and then another question from him is, that, what do you think about um, privacy in, in the times of quantum computers? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Uh, you might think, okay, I'm gonna, gonna sort of send my jobs through the clouds to wake on a computer, for instance, owned by IBM, which will run it. And then you, you sort of give uh, IBM the circuit you wanna run and the data you wanna run it on. Uh, but there are these, these cryptographic schemes about delegated computation and, and obfuscated delegated computation that, that allow you to do this at, at the expense of some more inefficiency that allow you to do this in the cloud without really giving away information about what job you're running. So in principle, I think this is a solved problem. Yes. But, but like with many things, you know, um, there's a cost inefficiency 
there's a cost inefficiency with using error correcting codes. There's a cost inefficiency with stacking different layers of public key cryptography. And also here, there's a cost inefficiency in by encoding or obfuscating the job you want to run before sending it to the cloud. So I guess one of the things you mean here are, is this uh, blind quantum computation. Yeah, that, sorry, that was the word I was looking for. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. blind quantum computation. Thank you. And Bruno's question you already answered. Yeah. Um, yes, so then there is uh, uh, Eduardo Luis Santos Delgado ask whether, uh, well, as, the, as quantum computing grows, I guess we will need an operating system like Linux or Windows for classic computers or some kind of software to handle the quantum hardware. Uh, so the question is whether you could imagine that whether there is a research field about quantum operating systems, I guess. And yeah, this research field exists. So people are designing quantum programming languages and quantum compilers. Um, to me, this is sort of running ahead of the... Uh, so I think at this point, really the two biggest questions are, can you build a quantum computer? And if you can, what kind of problems can it solve quickly? Uh -huh. This is... This is uh, uh, so the second is sort of a software question, but it's one abstraction level higher than issues about operating systems and computer architectures, etc. Uh -huh. So I think a lot of effort has been going for, into people designing platforms and programming languages, etc. I think there's a bit of a commercial agenda there that these people just want to uh, make, make their system the dominant flat platform with a view to later uh, uh, monetizing that. I think intellectually, this, these questions are at this point less interesting than the questions of building a quantum computer and finding out what it could do in principle. Thanks, that was a clear answer. Next, next question from Christian. Uh, yes, so he asks, so I'm curious if you would have some suggestions on what can I do to ramp up, improve and potentially comp contribute to the quantum computing world. Any book, training, courses, suggestions would help a lot as well. Uh, I think at some point in my talk, I mentioned read my lecture notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, there's many resources out there. Some of them are expensive, like the Nielsen Chuang book, which is kind of a famous book. It's by now it's 20 years old, though. Uh, but there's also lots of people's lectures notes notes out there. John Watrous has a wonderful book about quantum information, which you can which you can freely access. Um, there's there's online courses. Uh, for instance, Umesh Fazirani has a wonderful online course. I think MIT has a whole sequence of courses. I think the University of Delft has courses. Uh, also, my course, which are based on my lecture notes, uh, has video lectures. You can just go to my homepage and uh, and you'll mm -hmm. find links to the video lectures corresponding to the different chapters of my of my lecture notes. It kind of depends on which direction you want to go to, right? If you're a theoretical computer scientist, I would say read my lecture notes. If you're a physicist, uh, don't read my lecture notes. Read something totally different. Exactly. Um, we already yeah. put there the link for your lecture notes. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, this, this is just one of many sets of lecture notes that are out there. But I put a lot of effort into polishing this, and it also has a lot of exercises, so you can kind of train yourself. So, uh, and the other thing I would say to Christian, so I, I completely agree that that's a very good answer, is that if you are in the beginning level or something, you can also attend one of QWorld's uh, workshops and uh, yep. start to learn quantum computing from. There's yeah. also tons, tons of talks on YouTube and many of them are good. Yes. Exactly. Some of them are bad, many of, many of them are good though. So then Stephen Diadamo asked, uh, which actually a question that you already touched on, what is your perspective on the quantum internet? Yeah, quantum internet. Um, so the way I think about quantum internet is sort of a network of quantum computers that are connected either by pairwise shared entanglements or by quantum channels, maybe even by both. And I think this is very interesting. So one thing you could do in this network is secure communication by means of something like quantum key distribution, but there's also a bunch of distributed computing tasks you could do a lot faster. On the other hand, uh, most of the things we use the internet for at the moment, the classical internet, uh, uh, those are things that a quantum computer will not help. So I don't, I don't think a quantum internet is going to supplant uh, the classical internet, just like a quantum computer is not going to supplant your, your desktop PC. Um, uh, so, 
you know, so I think the, the word internet makes it sound a little bit more grandiose than, than it is. Um, if, if, if you replace it by, uh, by, let's say, the phrase quantum networks, then I'm all for it. I think it's very interesting. Uh -huh. And it's also probably closer to realization than a quantum computer for the reasons that I mentioned before. Things like preparing and measuring photons. We can't do it perfectly, but we're better at it than building a universal quantum computer. Yes, yes, the technology is more developed. Yeah. It's also just easier. That's why it's more developed. Yeah, yes. It's not easy, but it's easier. Yes. Thank you. Sayeh has the following question. I was wondering if you could comment on the relationship between quantum mechanics and number theory, such as the analysis of Hamiltonians and their eigenvalues from a number theoretic perspective, or whether computer scientists consider these questions at all. Uh, that's slightly out there. Uh, yeah, what can I say about that? I remember there was an interesting paper by Wim van Dam a long time ago um relating quantum computers to some number theoretic uh, problems of course sort of the, the obvious number theoretic application of quantum computers okay. is algorithms for factoring and discrete logarithms etc but i don't think that's what this question is aiming at yes because also hamiltonian sorry yeah yeah i mean some very structured hamiltonians have very very nicely behaved uh, nicely behaved eigenvalues um, I think you can even set up Hamiltonians that have something to do with the Riemann hypothesis, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, exactly. But but I, I really don't don't want to say more about that because I'm uh, I'm very thin ice here. So the short short answer is some work on this has been done. Google can probably tell you more than I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Akash Kumar Singh asks question that if a physicist wants to contribute to quantum computing, theoretical or experimental, does he or she need the knowledge? of a computer scientist or like well, some knowledge in computer science. If, if, you want to, if you want to contribute to theoretical quantum computing, I would say yes. If you want mm -hmm. to contribute to experimental uh, quantum computing, probably not. And what about in theoretical, which part of, which aspects of computer science is it? Um, but let me first say a little bit about the, so, so if you want to do experimental physics, you don't need to do uh, experimental quantum computing. You don't need to know a lot of computer science, but it is good to be aware of some of the uh, sort of basic things. So for instance, even some famous experimentalists have been going around giving popular talks, uh, saying that exponentially big problems like the traveling salesman problem, they can easily be handled by a quantum computer by just trying out all exponentially many routes through your graph in a superposition. Right? And this is total nonsense. And even the most basic uh, knowledge of, of complexity theory will, will tell you that this is not, not going to work. And the main reason we don't believe this is going to work is because we know that Grover's algorithm gives at most a quadratic speed up and not an exponential speed up. Uh, so I, th I think it's good aware to, it, to be aware at least of the basics, uh, even when you're experimental quantum computer scientist, just to prevent kind of obviously wrong things that then journalists will take even further down, down the rabbit hole of craziness. Um, if you want to do theoretical quantum computing, um, so there's a bunch of different areas. So one area would be, uh, let's say, quantum information theory, uh, things related to entanglement manipulations and channel capacities, etc. Um, and the aspect of, of computer science to learn there would be, would be things like uh, classical information theory. I don't know if you want to consider that part of CS, but uh, let's say things like entropies and mutual information, so, uh, Shannon's theorem, that kind of stuff. Um, if, if you really want to do algorithm related uh, things, so some of the best quantum algorithms have actually been discovered by physicists using physics intuition. Uh, and, and I think having a physics intuition is very helpful even for computer science aspects like designing quantum algorithms. But you sort of have to know what you're comparing with and you have to, you have to learn to be really precise about how you access your input data. Uh, and, and these are things you could learn from, from, from computer scientists. Uh, you should definitely be able to kind of read the classical literature. If you, if you want to find a fast quantum algorithm for problem X, definitely you should be able to read the CS literature and understand what is already known about X and how, what are there, if there's fast solutions for X. There have been examples of quantum algorithms, you know, that claim to speed up something and where the author was unaware of the fact that there was already a much better classical, much smarter classical algorithm out there. Um, yeah, so you certainly, you need to know some computer science to prevent such pitfalls. Other than that, I think this is still a very broad question. So uh, yes. it really depends on what you're interested in. Thank you. I think you, you gave an exhaustive answer. 
Bruno Federici also asked that uh, I've heard many times we need a logical qubit to physical qubit ratio of something like one to 1000. Can you please comment on this? So I guess this is about error correction. And yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's sort of okay to have such, such, such numbers or rules of thumb around just to give you some idea of what the overhead would be of error correction. I think the number of a thousand is, I, I, the, the number I heard more often would be 10,000. But these numbers are all based on assumptions, right? So, so the noisier your qubits are, the more uh, physical qubits you need for your error correction. So this number a thousand probably comes from some fairly optimistic assumptions about how noisy the actual qubits are, what the actual decoherence times are, how faulty your, your quantum gates are. If you make very optimistic assumptions, you might get to one in a thousand. I think if you make slightly more realistic assumptions, you might get to one in 10,000. Um, okay. If you're very pessimistic, you might get to one in a million. Uh, so, uh, and, and it's not clear at this point in time what realistic assumptions are because the hardware is still developing. So in, in a way, the assumptions we can make in five or 10 years will be more optimistic uh -huh. than the assumptions we can make today. And therefore, the number of qubits needed for error correction will be correspondingly lower. Uh -huh. So you would say that currently this would be like an optimistic uh, ratio? Uh, yeah, that's my gut feeling. But uh, I would have to kind of dig into the literature. Pe people have done calculations about this, right? I've seen papers with tables saying if you make these and these assumptions, you need a thousand qubits, physical qubits for a logical qubit. If you make these and these assumptions, you need 10,000. Um, Thank you. Adam Gloss, who is actually a core member of QPoland and the Q board member of QWorld, uh, asked the following question. My family asked me from time to time how the quantum, how com quantum computers will affect them personally. They are not working for an IT company or anything like that. I threaten them that at worst they will have to go to the bank for private keys. Is there a better answer? Is there an answer which is correct at all? <laughs> so basically, it's um, well, uh, first, of course, you have to make the assumption that somebody will build a large quantum computer, right? If this doesn't happen, then uh, the average person in the street will not be affected by this at all. Apart maybe from seeing gleeful newspaper headlines saying that quantum computing collapses. Uh, so, but let's let's make the assumption, which I also did for the purposes of this talk, that in 10 or 20 years, somebody will build a large quantum computer. Um, so I think people will notice this um, in sort of a stream of improved, uh, for instance, improved uh, materials and, and medicine. Quantum computers will help in making these things better. Now, whether this is something that, that where people will actually notice that this comes from a quantum computer is not totally clear because even today, you know, just using better and better classical computers, there is a stream of improved uh, drugs and materials, etc. So what, what people will notice, I think, is that quantum computers will help, will help continue progress in those areas. Uh, and then when they read about it, they will see that this is thanks to the fact that there's a quantum computer behind the scenes. Um, so how will this affect them personally? Uh, some things will get better. Um, it's of course also possible, you know, that suddenly all crypto uh, cryptography will collapse. This is kind of a worst case scenario. And it, uh -huh. at, at that point, people will definitely notice it because their credit card will stop working or, or, they will, <laughs> yes. or they will no longer be secure enough to use their credit card. Yes. Um, so is, is the answer correct? Uh, is there a correct answer to this? Um, the, your I, mean, uh, I think there's a you, you can glean some sort of possible scenarios from my little paper and from this talk yes thank you very much this was all the questions thank you for this great talk and for You're welcome. The really nice answers so maybe i would give the word to abu so there's, there's nothing more in the chat to answer to no because uh, we are uh, <laughs> We are uh, copying all the questions here, okay. and these were all the questions that also popped up. And of course, there is uh, lots of uh, congratulations from uh, from uh, to your talk from everyone here. I, I won't yeah. read all of them. I'm just happy to give this talk. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for this excellent talk. Also, thanks for staying us like 40 more minutes for this question answer session. Uh, last time it was also like 40 minutes. Yes. I guess our question answer session will be legendary. I hope. Uh, so also thanks to people stay until now we, we have more than 40 people still 
thanks to all of them. And uh, Ronald, it was excellent. As usual, I, I knew your talk before also, I always enjoyed. And, and it was also excellent. And also really thanks uh, to stay us with uh, longer for the question answers. Good. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thank you.